It's time for This Week in Science and Education, the Internet show that talks about all things health research and science related, new discoveries, new cures. How do we take this information and how do we make it relevant for the teachers and students in today's classroom? We're going to find out next. Stay tuned for This Week in Science and Education. This Week in Science and Education is brought to you by Sheridan Institute of Technology and Advanced Learning. At Sheridan, students shine brighter. Visit their website at SheridanShineBrighter.com. Hey everybody, it's time for This Week in Science and Education. This is episode 38, recorded Tuesday, May the 3rd, 2011. In the news! Hey everybody, thanks for joining us today. Um, interesting show today. We've got a whole bunch of news articles uh, put forward by our good friend and colleague, Colin Jago, over there at the Cork of the Pine Ridge District School Board. How mm -hmm. are you, Colin? I'm just great. How are things down there, Kev? Things are awesome. We've got a lot of rain. I can't get enough of that. That's fantastic. Oh, perfect. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, lots of good stuff. Um, what's going on in Kawartha these days? Well, you know what? It's uh, it's busy. <laughs> it's the time of year and when everything that you've been planning for all year sort of starts to happen. And so, you know, you're trying to plan for the end, but then you're also full steam in, in working through the things that are still going on. So it's uh, it's busy around here. Quick little uh, note on that. When is the uh, last day of uh, school? Is that the end of May for you guys, or does it actually roll into June for a little bit? How about the end of June? Like June 30th, I think, is our last working day. We go right Sorry, to last day of school before exams. Um, somewhere around the 20th of June, maybe? 17th, 18th of June, somewhere? I'd have to look it up. Okay, and so for those listeners then, I think our last show is going to be June 21st then. Isn't that right, fellas? Third week of uh, uh, June, June 21st? No, we have a guest right on the 28th as well. We have one right that very last week. Okay, June 28th. Okay, so we're going right to the end of June. Cool. Yeah. Dr. Thomas Merritt up there at Laurentian University. What's going on in Sudbury? Snow, rain? If you tell us it's sunny and 25, <laughs> we're hanging up right now. Well, we're on the way up. Yeah, yeah. It, this, yeah. Is, this is the time of year where it's very obvious that we live in northern Ontario. Um, it's, uh, it was zero this morning or just, just about there, thereabouts. So uh, it's cold. And my brand new racing single is in the boathouse just desperately wanting to get on the water. Um, mm -hmm. But at least there's no ice in the lake as of last week. So, uh, you know. The end is near, but you got a new go. boat. Yeah, no, Racing Shell is, is in the hangar and ready to go. Um, Excellent. Yeah, so looking forward to getting out on the water. And so our school is is done, being the university, mm -hmm. right? So we, we're yes. wrapped up. I handed in my grades this morning. I've already found out one of the grades is wrong. So the grades oh, have been excellent. posted. <laughs> yeah, they've been posted for about an hour, and I've already got to fill out one form to correct a grade. Um, <laughs> and I've got a whole fleet of new students coming in, so it'll be a busy summer. Uh, good stuff. Well, let's get to some of these news items. Uh, these were all put forward by uh, Colin. So, uh, Colin, you want to talk about the Pharaoh's curse first? That always sounds Pharaoh's fun. Pharaoh's curse. Well, I don't really think it was a Pharaoh's curse um, so much as, as, you know, groups of people trying to figure out, um, you know, what they can about Pharaoh's using modern techniques. It's, it's actually a really interesting story. And the more you read into it, it's it's very interesting. First of all, the science that was published in the paper that the article is based on was very interesting. But then there's also sort of a, a controversy around the techniques. That's also very interesting. And I know I know uh, uh, Thomas has said he has some background in that, so it'll be kind of interesting to have a little chat about that. But basically, that the, these researchers have claimed that they're sequencing DNA from mummies. And this particular um, particular one was, was actually King Tut. So I guess if you're going to pick a mummy, you pick the most famous one, and then you get a Discovery Channel show out of it, which is what, uh, which is what these folks actually did. Um, <laughs> and so, you know, they've, they've, they've made claims that they've, they've sequenced the DNA and they were able to pull out enough information from both the King Tut DNA and in some of the other uh, mummies that were, were with them to put together sort of a small family tree and they were able to find things that indicated you know that there may have been TB and malaria and some other diseases that may have contributed to certain deaths. They found um, one where they, there was two small bodies that they claim were, were stillborn and the genetic evidence points to them being stillborn children of King Tut. Um, so like, very interesting stuff and you know, it was kind of a high-profile thing. They uh, um, they had published, or sorry, the uh, Discovery Channel had filmed um, a documentary while they were doing it, 
Um, and of course, one of the little side bits in the article was, you know, when when you got Discovery filming you, you're under pretty good pressure to come up with some pretty good results, right? So, um, <laughs> and, you know, yeah. and again, there, there's some there's some there's some really uh, uh, valid concerns with with that sort of uh, approach to to doing science. Um, so it was really interesting to see what they were coming up with, and then sort of the, the 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 other camp, I guess, if you will, talking about this ancient DNA, is the camp that says we don't have the techniques, we can't do it. This stuff is all due to contamination. It's due to to errors, um, and any of the conclusions they're drawing can't be drawn because the techniques aren't good enough. And so there's a real sort of scientific battle between the people who say it's not possible and the people who say it is possible. And we're not sure where the where the reality is. Um, but it was really it was really interesting to, to just to think about the fact that we could do this, even if we're, you know, maybe the reality is we can only sort of sort of do it now. But we're getting to that point, so um, it was kind of neat. Now, Thomas, I want you to, to weigh in here. You know, maybe first of all on the on the actual science of the PCR replication of these ancient DNA strands. Like, are they are they actually doing it or is there something else going on? What do you like? What do you think from a, from yeah, a genetic point a, of view? It's <coughs> a good a question. Bacon, they're actually we didn't they're land on the moon <laughs> either. <laughs> so the, there are a number of really good points that, that come out of this particular piece, and, and I, I think we should try to, to, to go through all of them. Um, mm -hmm. One is the idea that, that in in many ways this was a directed research project, and the direction of the research was selling a TV program, sure. and that doesn't mean that you can't have good science. But that puts a pressure on on the science that that's not otherwise there, and I, I want us to come back to that because it, in the third article that, that mm -hmm. if we don't get a chance to talk to talk about today, we'll, we'll talk about later, and it's this idea that Canadian research is being shifted towards industry partnerships, and yeah. industry partnerships are, are awesome in bringing money into research, sharing the cost of research, so it's not all a, ta a taxpayer burden. We're, we're now getting industrial partners. And, and really pushing the idea that, that we should be able to use the knowledge that we're generating. Um, on the other hand, one of the drawbacks to, to indust, industrial driven research is this idea of directed research. And mm -hmm. you know sometimes it, it's directed in the sense that they just need a better drill bit. Um, that, that's one of the <laughs> examples that comes out of the, the mining uh, research partnerships here in Sudbury. Um, but in a you know, worst case scenario, what, what the forestry company needs is research that shows that their pattern of foresting is good for the environment. And if the researcher's evidence is, is, is not following that, are they going to keep funding it? And there are a lot of unfortunate examples in, in pharmacological, uh, pharmacology company driven research where the research really seems to reflect the company agenda more than, than good basic science. So in, in this case, you know, we're, we're looking at a research project that is being funded by a group that wants something exciting. And sure. they don't want to uh, open up Al Capone's vault. And I'm dating myself <laughs> here, but her, you know, Gerardo, uh, Gerardo Geraldo. Rivera. Geraldo, there, there we go, it? sorry. Geraldo <laughs> Rivera opens up this vault and finds nothing. Right? And, nothing. and as a teenager, I watched the three hour uh, Gerard, uh, Geraldo special, and at yeah. the end of that, they open up this box, and, and there's nothing inside it, right? So, Thomas, I just want to interrupt you for a little bit and ask you a, a little question. <laughs> so, you're saying there's a little bit of extra pressure on, um, you know, if you're doing a science show, basically, that it'd be nice to have some neat science to look at at the end of the show. Do, mm -hmm. do researchers or scientists ever feel that pressure when they're funded as well by different organizations, like yeah, funded I, by it, a drug it, company, it, or, you know? Oh, uh, it, it, and it's not. It, that kind of pressure is, is not um, just when you're, you're funded by a, a drug company. Um, so yeah, the, where, where we were talking about the idea of, you know, is this going to be driven by discovery needing mm -hmm. to have an exciting um, result? Um, anytime you're doing research, your ability to get funding to continue to do research is based on those results. And so there's always a pressure for results. Um, and in the best case scenario, that pressure is to get you in the lab, get you motivated, get the students motivated, produce work, not to manufacture work. And, but the question is always, is, is work being manufactured? And, and there are plenty of cases where people are manufacturing data um, to further their own career. And, and this is not something that I'm saying mm -hmm. just because this particular project is, is driven by discovery. So we, we're talking about the idea of whether what kind of pressures there are in science. And, sure. and one of the things that Colin brought up in this particular case is the idea that 
because the research is, is the focus of this Discovery Channel um, program, you know, is, was there pressure on them to come up with exciting results? And, and mm -hmm. I think the answer to that question is absolutely. And so the, then the, the question is, is that, did that actually um, influence the results? And right. the, the hope is that it did not. And it's not like, and, and this is what I think what Kevin was getting to with this last comment, any time we do research, there's pressure to come up with good results. The more exciting mm -hmm. the research, the more high profile the research, the better your chances of being funded to do this again. So is this kind of pressure something that these researchers would have never seen before? Absolutely not. Is it something we should be aware of? Certainly. And I think it's mm -hmm. something that when you're teaching your students about science, you can talk about. And there's, there is always an agenda. And I, I, one of the favorite stories that I have to talk about agendas in science came up last week uh, when we were talking to um, the, the science educator and, and he was talking about the history of science. And one mm -hmm. of the examples that he gave was Rosalind Franklin and Rosalind Franklin yeah. actually generating the data that Watson and Crick used to, uh, to come up with the, the three-dimensional model for DNA, for their model mm -hmm. of DNA. I have taught that particular example as, as, or that particular case as an example of how women in science have often been overlooked and their contributions have been overlooked. That said, I think a better way to look at that example is that Franklin may have been overlooked. She certainly didn't have a great relationship with her advisor, and her advisor is the one that gave the, the, the information over to Watson and Crick. She, mm -hmm. however, continued to have a very good relationship with Washington, friendship with Watson and Crick until she died. She didn't receive the Nobel Prize, but she was also dead when they received it, and you can't receive a Nobel Prize right. posthumously. And that, right. that fact is often skipped over. So in the 70s, when it really came to light what her contribution was, this was a period of time where there was a lot of political pressure, a lot of social pressure, to show that women had been left out of science. And here was a great example of a woman who was left out in science. And I think that that example took on a life of its own beyond really what the, the truth was. Hmm. Was she overlooked and, and shortchanged? Probably. Was she overlooked and shortchanged to the, to the extent that this story would have us believe? Maybe not. And, hmm. you know, you, you just need to understand some of the context behind that. And I think that that's something, when, anytime we're doing science, we can think about those kind of contexts. So was there pressure here to come up with exciting results? Yeah. Does that mean the results are, are not true? No. But it's something we need to keep in mind. Right. And, and we'll, we'll maybe talk a little bit more about that when we come back to the idea of industry and, and science. Right. Now, Colin, you'd asked about just the, the basic mm -hmm. science here. Yeah, let's, this let's is talk a about really, that for a bit. It's a really neat fundamental science story. What they're trying to do is use DNA sequence to answer a series of questions. All right? Right. DNA is, is, that's three, so there would be four there, four base pairs. All right? So the information in DNA is either a G, A, T, or a C. You've got the four, G, A, T, C, there we go. You've got the four bases. If you have a, a piece of DNA that's four bases long, it's you know, some combination of those four bases. The longer right. the piece of DNA, the more information that's there. Mm -hmm. And because we only have those four bases to work on, you really need to have a fairly long stretch before you start getting information that allows you to say this piece of DNA from one person is the same or different than that piece of DNA from another person. Okay. Historically, when we work with DNA sequence, we work with large stretches. And what we're trying to do is amplify and then sequence. And by sequence, we mean read that GATC. And mm -hmm. we often do this with polymerase chain reaction to amplify the DNA and Sanger sequencing to sequence the DNA. Can you explain so, what you mean by amplify? Absolutely. So, okay, let me just finish that sentence and then we'll go back okay. to amplify. <laughs> and, and the goal of that amplify and sequence is to read a piece of DNA. And what we've tried to do since the 70s is read longer and longer continuous pieces of DNA. And so we've gone okay. from like 300 or 400 base pairs when I started sequencing DNA to about 2,000 base pairs. And, and realistically, you can talk about 1,000 to 1,500 base pairs. So 1,000 to 1,500 letters. All right. Now, that, that part is relatively straightforward. You've got a string of letters that is 1,000 bases long. Mm -hmm. any, any one of us has a, a genome. Right? You've got this, this uh, piece or this, this sequence of, of DNA in, in your cell. If we want to know, if we want to compare one individual with another individual, 
Mm -hmm. We're not going to try to compare the entire genome. We're going to pick a region of the genome, and we want to look at that exact same region in every person that we're comparing. And so, mm -hmm. you know, for, for example, we often look at the cytochrome B gene. And the cytochrome B gene is a gene, it codes for a particular protein called cytochrome B, but we're going to use it just for the information content and say, does your cytochrome sequence look like his cytochrome sequence look like his cytochrome sequence? In, in my lab, we're using 16S, and that's a, a piece of DNA that codes for the 16S fragment of a ribosome. All right? And so we look to see it at these various different 16S fragments. And in any, in any given sample, you have all the DNA from that individual, a very small fraction of which is the gene that you want to compare, whether it's cytochrome B or 16S. Mm. Not enough to actually read. It's just, it's okay. there, but it's in such low concentration. It's in such low concentration we can't read it. All right. And so what we do is we use something called polymerase chain reaction that goes in and amplifies a particular sequence. And so instead of having a couple of hundred copies, from every one copy, we can, in theory, make a million copies. And we, so we get a million-fold amplification. And now you've got a sample of DNA. And instead of having a few copies of your gene, you've got a million copies. And we can go okay. in and directly read that with a chemical process that says the first letter is this, the second letter is this, third, fourth, fifth. And that process that we use is usually Sanger sequencing. And that, takes, that gives us a piece of DNA that's 1,000 to 1,500 base pairs. OK? okay. So, that 1,500 is, is important, or 1,000 base pairs is, is important. The, the magic number there is, is 1,000 base pairs. And what we've been doing in, in sequencing biology for the last, literally since, since the 70s, is getting the, the length of DNA that we can read at one time longer and longer. And, and so the upper limit of that for a single read is somewhere around 2,000 base pairs. And realistically, when I do my research, we're looking at 1,000 base pairs of really good data. OK, so now we get to the idea of ancient DNA. Right. DNA is, is just this polymer, right? And, and it, it is, while it's this amazing informational molecule, at its heart, it's just a, DNA, it's just a macromolecule. It's a long string of individual monomers. And those monomers behave biochemically. I mean, they, they have a biochemistry of their own. And we often forget this. One of the things, because the A of DNA is acid, they're acidic. And in an aqueous environment, through time, they break down. And there's absolutely no way mm. around that. Now, the rate of decay varies. And one of the things that's come up in, this, in the mummy studies is it varies with water content. In an aqueous yes. solution, in an, in an unbuffered aqueous solution, DNA breaks down relatively quickly. So if the, pH, if the pH is allowed to be relatively or even slightly acidic, the DNA breaks down. Okay, so if the DNA breaks down with time, the older the DNA, the shorter the fragments. The shorter the fragments, the less information in any one fragment, and the harder it is to distinguish one, one string of bases from another string of bases, and the more likely that you're going to get contamination from another source. And the reason for this is that PCR, which is this, the, the method that we use to amplify the DNA to allow us to sequence it, PCR likes longer fragments. Okay. And so if you use polymerase chain reaction to amplify the DNA, and there are no short, sorry, there are no long fragments from your original sample, that system is just going to sit there and, and the, the biochemistry is going to click along if there's even a small, small concentration of contaminating DNA, that's what you're going to amplify. And so we've been dealing with this, this issue of contamination in ancient samples since people started working with ancient samples. And there, there are two schools, and that, this is what had come up in that mm -hmm. article, mm -hmm. is there are a lot of people that, that have basically said, look, because of the, the basic nature of DNA, and, and the acidic nature, but the fundamental nature of DNA, it will degrade through time. Because it degrades through time, you don't, you're not going to have fragments long enough to amplify after X number of years. And X mm -hmm. ends up being relatively short. Okay? Um, and so you've got the one camp that says it's going to break down, and the other camp that says it's not going to break down because the mummies are, are kept in a, a um, dehydrated condition. If you're looking mm -hmm. at microbial DNA, which one of the, the studies was looking at, yeah. the microbial DNA survives longer, and because that's going to survive longer, you've got a better chance of, of picking that up. The, the punchline Thomas, at the can end I interrupt you for a second? Absolutely. 
I just wanted to point out, I, and I might be wrong about this, but it seems to me like this argument was around about 10 years ago as well when Jurassic Park came out, you know, and, and there was these two <laughs> camps saying, no, this is not possible, this is possible. It's, you're talking about millions of years old DNA. Or we're talking about the same thing here, right? Yeah, a absolutely. And I think we've even talked about this on the program that there are ways to, to get around this, and, and it becomes particularly difficult when you're working with human DNA. And the, the problem is how do you distinguish DNA that's really there from contamination, right? And if you've got an archaeological s sample, mm. if it's contaminated with something, it's going to be contaminated with human DNA from handling it, or possibly bacterial DNA from the surrounding environment, right? Mm -hmm. And when we've done these studies where you, s where you extract total DNA from like a Neanderthal bone, the vast majority of DNA that you extract from that is microbial, bacterial, that has nothing to do with, with the Neanderthal. It's the bacteria mm -hmm. that, that colonized this bone since it was, was deposited there. Right. Now, you know, so there are tricks that you can do to try to distinguish contaminating DNA from the, the, the real DNA in, in the sample. When you start trying to ask questions about ancient human DNA, it becomes more difficult because how do you distinguish ancient human DNA from modern human DNA. We expect them to be extremely similar. And so when you find things that are similar, is that because it's contaminating or because the ancient sample was uh, very similar? Right. And that, that's sort of the, the stumbling block that, that we run into. And contamination it, it is always going to be an issue. The technology that's changing that, that they bring up in this paper in particular is the new generations of sequencing, so the, the new sequencing technology, which we call next generation technology, although now we're really at the next, next generation of sequencing technology. <laughs> but the push has gone from these long fragments of DNA where you've got a thousand base pairs that you're reading to shorter and shorter fragments. And if the push now is we're going to get lots of 30 base pair or 60 base pair fragments, and we're going to use computational techniques to reassemble those, this idea that you can't sequence ancient DNA <clears throat> because the DNA is degraded, that problem goes away. And that's what they're hoping is going to happen with a lot of these ancient studies, is we'll be able to use these current generation of sequencing technologies to get around the idea of the degraded DNA keeping us from working with that. But if you pause for a second to think about this, it'll also allow us to sequence the contaminating DNA. So the issue mm -hmm. of contamination doesn't go away but the issue, the issue of this absolute timeline that you shouldn't be able to sequence past this point does. So contamination is always going to be an issue, and they're going to be, it, there, there have to be things to, to address that. Um, how are you going to handle contamination in something like Tutankhamun, a mummy that has been handled extensively by lots mm -hmm. of people over the last you know, X number of decades? That's a really tricky question. Um, but if you're going to work on a mummy, and you've got a high-profile project, then it's it's hard to imagine a more high-profile mummy than than Tutankhamun. Yeah. Uh, but it you know it's a really interesting study because of all these different layers. While we wait for Colin to come back, uh, that is a fantastic explanation, Thomas. Uh, that's you know I even understood uh, most of what you were saying there. That was really detailed. So that was fantastic. Those of you that are wondering about the actual news item, uh, you can find that news item on Nature News. It's called um, Ancient DNA, Curse of the Pharaoh's DNA. I believe it's Nature Article 472. Um, I would like to take a quick break. When we come back, we're going to talk about rethinking PhDs. Uh, do we need to overhaul our PhD program? Uh, we're going to get uh, Thomas's opinion and Colin's opinion on that when we come back. <laughs> Before we talk about that, uh, I do want to mention our good friends over at Mueller Systems in Woodstock, Ontario, Canada. They are the makers of your backup software. If you have those documents and pictures and let's say you're working on DNA and you don't want to lose some of your research, well, guess what? We have a solution for you. You can use Mueller's backup system on your network or on your computer. Try it free for 90 days by visiting MuellerData.com slash VROC. That's M-U-L-L-E-R-D-A-T-A dot com slash VROC. Install it, configure it, test it, 90 days. We encourage you to give it a try. MuellerData.com slash VROC. We thank them again for their support. Sorry, guys, that was a fascinating news item uh, and article, and we'll put some more maybe comments in the show notes, but uh, we're running shy on time, so let's get to the next item here. Uh, Colin, education, rethinking PhDs, what do, what do we mean by that? Well, it means Thomas's degree is not very valuable by the sounds of it. Um, no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. But it's, it, it's actually a very interesting article, and there were sort of two two articles that I, I ran across that dealt with 
sort of the concept of, of uh, PhDs. Um, one of them talking about, you know, the number of PhDs that are being created around the world in different countries and what that means in different countries and how different countries are, are, are you know, either aiming to produce more or attempting to deal with the PhDs that they're, they produce who then maybe don't have anywhere to work, right? So there's, there's that side of the coin. And then there's the, the whole idea of, of getting one in the first place, right? And a lot of people in, in this one article were talking about it. There's some, some you know, issues around the, the actual process that uh, a student would go through in, in doing research and in getting their PhD. And these, this article actually went through some of the things that people are trying that may you know, to overhaul the system a little bit or look at different ways of doing it. And so it, it touched on a couple of different things. Um, things like, you know, maybe maybe admitting less students into the, the PhD process, but taking only like the Cracker Jacks and throwing them really heavily into, into really high-end research right at the, at, at the outset and so instead of sort of ramping up towards that. Um, other options, things like, you know, not going through universities. Um, you know, private, almost like private companies, almost like an on-the-job training through doing research. You know, like we talked about, like uh, um, um, pharmacological companies, for example, drug companies. You know, maybe there's a way that that professional organizations can sort of almost like an apprenticeship is sort of what I glean from it. And at the end, the skills gained are equivalent to what a PhD student in a traditional academic sense um, w would get and would go through. So things like that. Um, also, also talking about things like uh, trends towards online learning and what it would mean to get a science PhD in an online environment, and how could students do research, um, you know, with with everything that's required, and, and could it be done in, in different ways? Um, the one interesting one that I thought, and the one we've talked about here a lot, is is looking at at you know um, getting rid of the boundaries. The, I was saying the. Um, one of the, the most interesting ones was um, they've got under the heading of trample the boundaries, but we've talked about it actually a number of times, looking at an interdisciplinary approach to PhDs and sort of expanding um, um, the viewpoint a little bit to, to bring different disciplines together instead of, you know, the narrow focus on one particular, one particular aspect because, and I think we've, we've talked about this a lot, it's so interesting when you get out into, into the research end of things and look at how the synergies come when you've got different fields working together on a, a problem that you may not realize that somebody else has some valuable insight until you actually start talking to each other and the things that can come out of that. Um, so there was some interest, and then of course there, there was the option of, of you know skipping the PhD altogether. Is it really worth um, having? And they talked, they interviewed um, some some uh, people in business who said, you know, I'd rather have a really smart undergrad or master's student um, and not worry about having a, a PhD student, you know because of what I need them to do. They've got yeah. brains, they can go and do it. So, you know, to go through the whole PhD process, is, is it worth it in the end? So it was really interesting to think about it. I mean, I don't have a PhD. I don't, I've never gone through that route. Um, you know, Thomas has one and he's obviously working with, with masters and, and doctoral students. So what do you think from, from your point of view on sort of the, the whole process, the messiness that is the, the, the PhD system? Yeah. And <laughs> You know, like the like the first article that we talked about, there, there are a number of different, uh, you know, almost independent points here. Um, mm. There, there is internationally, it's been recognized that we we have a problem that we're generating more PhDs than we have jobs that have traditionally yes. been filled by by PhDs, um, and that that so that's one issue. The the other issue that. is is um, you know, what are the criteria behind getting a PhD, and, and mm -hmm. some of that comes down to what, what is it that you're trying to do, and if you're if you're going to work in a particular field, is a PhD really the degree that that uh, that you need for that you know that particular field, and, and this comes back to some of the in, the industrial questions. Sure. It, especially in, in well in any field. This is a conversation that we had last week with our guests, the idea of creativity and, and trying to mm -hmm. work with students to produce that, cre that creativity. One of the, the complaints that I have and, and that many people have about the PhD program is too often the, the emphasis in, is on com sort of com completing some set of coursework, um, some X number of years in the lab, mm -hmm. And then you've put your time in, and so now you deserve your, your PhD. Right. And that's...
that's not how I think of, of the degree, and, and I think historically, although I'm, I'm not a historian of science, but historically that's not what a PhD was about. And, and the emphasis, in my opinion, should be on, on content, so creating novel work. And this is supposed to be what sets a, a PhD apart mm. from other degrees, is this emphasis on generating this novel body of work. And if you're trying to create somebody who's going to go on and, and work in industry under a particular direction so that you need to produce a better drill bit, you need to produce whatever it is, maybe a PhD isn't the degree that you need for that, that right. you need to have a really good skilled technician, not necessarily a PhD student. And, and that's where the, the undergraduate hmm. degree or the master's degree might, might come in. Um, mm -hmm. And so that, you know, there are different ways to look at this. One of the knocks on, on a lot of, uh, on some current PhD programs is that they're not producing really good novel scientists, they're producing really good technicians. Um, but at the same time, that's what's actually wanted in the, the, the job field, is you want to have somebody sure. with a given set of skills, a given set of analytical uh, te uh, skills or te techniques, talents, um, and the ability to, to think on their own. And not mm -hmm. necessarily, and, and to, you know, within that realm to think on their own. So I, I, I'm sort of putting together these two. Mm -hmm. They're not they're not mutually independent. So in both cases, you need somebody who's creative. But the focus on a PhD is this generation of novel material, whereas the focus on a technician is coming up with somebody who's technically sound and able to work within a given set of boundaries. And I think one of the big deals is in my lab. So as a, a functioning working professor, I'm supposed to be pushing the envelope of science in some direction. If I'm an industrial scientist, I have a direction to my research and I have a, a purpose to that. I need to create hmm. the better drill bit. I need to get a drug for something or other. And that's the applied science. Do we really need PhD students or PhDs to do the applied science? And I, I don't know the, the answer to that, but that's, that's certainly hmm. the, the question. So on the one hand, do we have too many PhDs? Absolutely. Are there issues with how we're generating PhDs, how we're, we're actually deciding what, it, what counts as a PhD? Certainly. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, what's the, the solution for that? I don't know. I, the <laughs> only thing I could say that I do know is the online solution is not a good solution. Um, <laughs> I am an, an enormous, uh, I, 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 I am not a fan of, of this sort of online education. And, and at the undergraduate level, we're seeing more and more uh, students that are taking courses that are online courses and you know they, they log on, they do the work, they go away. I honestly think that education is about hands-on working with students. And I think that having these kind of online tools are fantastic. I wouldn't be participating in, in an online podcast if mm -hmm. I didn't. But I don't think that this is any way a substitute for having somebody working with a student one-on-one -on -one or in a small setting like that. Mm -hmm. um, and so I don't think that, that online is, is a solution, uh, but it can certainly be a component to education. And that's exactly the point that, that was really interesting when I was reading it, and it was sort of a it was sort of a hybrid model where maybe the some of the I want to say the administrivia kind of stuff was done on online, for example, but then the student themselves spent time in, in different countries, in different labs, working with different people, right? Sort of had that freedom to go to different places and do different components of their work on their major project, you know, sort of independently putting it all together. But at some point, you got to get a degree from an institution. And so maybe sort of an, an online thing that then, it, a, it, there's different ways of looking at it, right? Different ways of putting it together. So I, I think I agree with you. And there was some interesting ways of, of getting at the best of both worlds, I think. Um, you know, whether we can actually pull that off or not, I guess, is another story altogether. Hey, guys. Sure. Uh, yeah, sorry, Thomas. I just wanted to pull up this graph that uh, was part of the article here a few minutes ago just to uh, give us some statistics here to work with. So this was uh, part of the article that talks about the rise of uh, doctorates and gives a, uh, for those of you who are listening by audio, it uh, lists several countries underneath. And the idea behind the, uh, the graph here is um, it's an average annual growth of what they think the doctoral degrees are going to be across um, um, mm. all disciplines. The years given are 1998 to 2006. And I think the first one on, uh, on the graph on the, in the far left is China. I don't know if you guys can read that across the screen there, but China is uh, uh, up 40 percent. I don't think that's of any surprise uh, if you've been following some of these trends recently. Mexico, I thought, was a surprise. They're up 17.1 uh, hmm. percent. I'll just read out the rest of these. Denmark, 10 percent. India, 8.5 uh, with a little caption that says, India hopes to dramatically increase PhDs by the year 2020. Mm -hmm. Korea, 7.1. Japan, 6.2. Australia, 6.2. 
Poland 6.1, and they also have a caption that reads, expansion of the higher education system after the fall of communism has led to growth. So that's no mm. surprise. Uh, mm. United Kingdom 5.2, United States 2.5, Canada 1, Germany 0. Hungary expects uh, the, uh, the to uh, see a decrease of 2.2%. So, um, um, gentlemen, put that in perspective for us, but there's some uh, statistics surrounding uh, granting PhDs. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Well, the, the, when you sort of read, whenever you read these things, you, the two biggest sort of PhD granting countries by sheer numbers are the U.S. and, and China's now overtaken them. Um, and people bemoan the fact in the U.S. that that's happened, but at the same time, there's not enough employment for people who are getting PhDs out of the U.S. So there's, there's sort of a, a dual-edged uh, problem right there. Um, when you look at what's happening in China with, with the incredible economic growth, basically they're those that huge growth in PhDs is, is it's, it's going together. People are getting them and then going off and working in industry or, or in other research areas or universities or whatever. So it's it's sort of fueling itself. So it's it's interesting to to look at those numbers and put them into a, a bit of sort of bigger context because this this does flow into the larger economic pictures around the planet. Sorry, Thomas, I what cut you off before I put that up there. Go ahead. I have no idea where we're going with that, that. But one of the things, just to follow up <laughs> on what, what Colin said. Um, PhDs are, are, are largely self-directed, right? So mm -hmm. the, the yes. PhD program, the PhD programs at Laurentian determine who get PhDs. And there is no magic list that says you have to hit these set of criteria um, before you generate a, a PhD. And, and basically it, it's just sort of there's a convention. We've all come up through sort of the same kind of education and we try to, to self-police and then within any given PhD committee there'll be a major professor or maybe a co-supervisor, um, the committee itself and then an external from somewhere outside that, that tries to give some semblance, semblance uh, of objectivity. But the number of PhDs can be easily manipulated and if for mm. whatever reason a particular group wanted to give a bunch of PhDs, there's nothing that says you cannot. And so we, we need to take those, those kind of numbers with a grain of salt. Um, what do the numbers mean? Um, does it mean that suddenly the best education system in the world is China because they're producing 40% more PhDs? I, I would argue that the answer is no, but I think that there probably are people in the Chinese education system who would say, well, obviously the answer is, is, is yes, maybe not sure. simply because of the numbers. but. When you think about this, and, I, and by you, I mean the high school teachers, thinking about how you're going to talk to uh, your students about this, it's the same kind of, of argument that we talked about with the science. So mm -hmm. what's driving the, the study of the mummies? Well, in that case, it was making good television. Did that influence the numbers? We hope not, but you just need to be aware of that. What's driving the number of PhDs that are coming to the country? And that what's driving that is going to be the, the goals of that country. And so if a particular country decided to give more PhD, it might be because they've improved their education system. Um, but there's nothing magic that says that they have. All right? So keep in mind that there is no magic number that says when you have hit 100, suddenly you count as a PhD. So mm. it, it's, it's a self-policed system and there are always going to be problems that, that are inherent in that. So those, I take those kind of numbers with, with a grain of salt. Um, now that said, if you look at, it, at a country that is, break, is dropping the number of PhDs, could that be because the education system is faltering? It, it could very well be. Could there be so many more PhDs in India and China because those countries are really getting their education system together and producing really good students? It could be. But the numbers don't mean that that has to be that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So just something to yeah, something that to Mexico keep. number, right? Eh? Yeah, I, you know, and, and it, it certainly it could be that the education system really in those countries is developing, and that's fantastic. It just we need to keep in mind what those numbers really mean and what they could potentially mean. Mm -hmm. um, I, and one of the things I, I started to say earlier is just the idea that we've talked about with with integration. Um, one of the real ad advantages to the current sort of multimedia and online world, we can work across geographical boundaries. So I just had a, a fourth year student who's, who just uh, graduated in the last couple of weeks. One of the co-supervisors on her fourth year project is a postdoc at McGill. 
and mm. she's from the or her husband lives in the suburb area. She comes back a couple of times over the course of the year, but we Skyped with her on a regular basis to get her input into the program. And Maxine, the undergrad in my lab, her project is much better for having Nadia's regular input because sure. Nadia is one of the world experts in, in the field. And so she could come in online through Skype and we could, the three of us or the four of us with a, a co-supervisor in the biology department, talk about the project um, in real time and have a face-to-face -face conversation using the internet uh, and use that as a way to really make an interdisciplinary project so we could take the expertise mm -hmm. that I have in my lab, that Nadia has in, in her research, uh, and bring that together. So that aspect of, of the, online or the online, online aspect of education, that part of it, um, is a big deal and will certainly help us make better integrated scientists. You will only be successful in modern science by working across those kind of boundaries, whether it's a technological boundary, a uh, sort of disciplinary boundary, or even the mm -hmm. geographical boundaries. Um, the right. world is too small a place to, to <coughs> ignore that. And you know, uh, going beyond the, uh, the the science impact of a PhD, in terms of an educational impact of a PhD, it might interest you to know, I was uh, recently down at Sheridan Institute of Technology and Advanced Learning, and they have actually decreed that uh, you must have a PhD in order to uh, teach at this college. Mm. Um, you know, so we might have uh, a trend developing there where higher education facilities or institutions are, you know, making that part of their mandate. Is uh, you want to teach here, then guess what? You need your PhD. A master's is no longer sufficient. So we might see yeah. that as well. And that, I mean, at the university it's level, that's probably de facto. I would think. You know, for most most profs, Thomas, and correct me if I'm if I'm if I'm wrong, but it's interesting that yeah. now these colleges are, are doing the same thing, filtering so down to the college. That's right. Yeah. So that that's great as long as PhD means something. Absolutely. Um, and the the problem with that, and I, I said it's great, but it, it's not. I, I <laughs> there are very few absolute rules that that are a really good idea. Um, some of the best researchers that I know do not have PhDs but sure. they have produced very good research. If the bottom line of, of getting a PhD, at least in, in, in sciences, the bottom line of getting a PhD is producing this novel body of research, in theory, everybody that has an independently de, uh, produced novel body of research it, is good, right? I mean, that's what mm -hmm. we're looking for is our, our benchmark. If you have a PhD, you should have that, and that may qualify you to be a good teacher. What if you have that body of research, but you don't have a PhD? If, if the whole point was just to have that body of research, it's not having those magic three letters. Mm -hmm. It's having that, that information. And so there mm -hmm. are some very, very good scientists out there without PhDs, and it could be just the way they've come through the system. And at this point in their career, they're not going to go back and get a PhD. Does right. that mean that they're not good instructors? I don't think so. Well, and, and to go along with that, and you made you made, you said that you know the three letters may make you a good teacher, and I'd argue that that has almost nothing to do with actually being a good instructor or teacher too. You have to think about what your organization is. Is it a research factory or is it an educational institution? Because if all you're doing is getting PhDs who are good researchers to train good researchers, that's one thing. But not everybody in the university becomes a researcher, right? And so there's the whole you know actual education component yeah. there as well, and that doesn't go you know PhD doesn't equal good educator either. It can, but it doesn't always. It doesn't have and to. It does and it Sorry, but ahead, what Tom. it does do, what, what that PH does do, it allows the administration, wherever it is, to say, hey, look, every one of our instructors has a magic yes. three letter, has those magic three letters. Are, and is that we marketable? Looked at? Absolutely. <laughs> that is absolutely marketable. Does that mean that, that your instructors are really good? No, it's just an easy yeah. marketing tool. And sure so that's is. really my, my point is, if the whole point is to have really good instructors, we need really good instructors. We don't need PhDs. Sure. Are PhDs good instructors? Some of them are, and many of them are not. Are all good instructors PhDs? But it's really hard to quantify we have yeah. really good instructors. It's really <laughs> easy to say every one of our faculty has those magic three letters. And, and this is coming from somebody with those magic three letters. Yeah. For those of you that are listening by uh, audio, I put a graphic up on the screen here a couple of minutes ago. Did you guys see this? Uh, the, the title is, What's a PhD Worth? And um, they're trying to determine, you know, uh, if you have a PhD, are you that much happier? 
Um, so there's two <laughs> graphs here, and uh, people with a PhD are marginally more satisfied uh, with their uh, with their jobs and with their their life than without a PhD. Uh, so, interestingly <laughs> enough, you get a PhD, that's no guarantee that you're going to be happy. <laughs> Anyways, it, it, guys, do we want to tackle it, this last article before we sign off today? We're sort of going at it a little bit. Uh, I was thinking about that. We can need to just take a take a, a stab real quick at the, the nuts and bolts of it. But we've been going at the big idea around that, and the the article has to do with with how um, the Canada's uh, National Research Council has recently underwent a, a shift in in um, let's say philosophy philosophy I guess or or a mandate in how they allocate research funds. Uh, and we've been talking about it. Basically, they made the shift in saying that many more of their research funds have to be directly tied to some sort of marketable innovation than it has been in the past. So it's the difference between you know, basic research and then a directed research program towards some end goal. And it, we talked about you know, discovery driving the, the DNA analysis of, of King Tut. Um, it's sort of the same thing. And now Canada's Research Council um, is specifically saying you l have to look for those industry partnerships. You have to come up with more targeted research goals in order to get some of this particular funding. So it's a shift in how uh, funding is allocated. And, you know, we've been going around that it could be good and it could be bad, and it's, it's kind of interesting to think about the ramifications both ways. So uh, I don't know, Thomas, you're, you're sort of, you know, reliant on, on funding for research. When we've talked about this, but what do you think it means in terms of, of Canadian research in general now that the actual research council has changed their philosophy a little bit? Uh, it, it, it means a number of things. Um, from a practical point of view, it means that you have to start thinking about doing applied research, no matter what your, mm -hmm. your field is. Uh, and just from a, from a purely practical, you're going to keep the lights on in your lab. You really mm -hmm. have to be looking at, at applied research. Um, in my particular case, because Laurentian is a relatively small school, um, small schools, whether you're in Canada or anywhere else, are generally at a disadvantage for research. Um, if you want to, one way to think about it is we have fewer students to, to pull from. The success of my sure. research program is, is based on having really bright students. It, it's not having your student with sort of their average motivation and your average skill in, in, in the classroom. It's about having a much more, than, much higher than average uh, level of motivation and, and level of aptitude in, in the classroom. Um, so you're talking about pulling from 1% of the students. 1% mm -hmm. of the students at Laurentian is a much smaller number than 1% of the students at, at Western. Right? So sure. small universities are, are somewhat handicapped in doing research. Um, the funding for basic research is getting skewed further and further away from small universities. And so mm. moving towards Westerns, moving towards McGill's, moving towards mm. uh, Toronto's. Um, so that's making things hard here. I don't know anybody at Laurentian who's not looking at applied research to fund their research program. So just hmm. from a purely practical point of view, everybody I know that's doing working science, that's a working scientist, is looking for an industrial tri a tie to keep their research programs opening. Uh, sorry, hmm. open. Um, from a philosophical point of view, <laughs> I don't have a great answer to that. Um, yeah. Part of me likes doing applied research because it's a really easy sell. I'm taking sure. taxpayer numbers, or I'm taking taxpayer money to do research. If, if even to myself justifying that money, if I can cure cancer without creating zombies, then <laughs> I've spent that. That or are they vampires? Um, I've spent that money <laughs> well. Right. But at the same time. The, the large-scale, large long-term advancement of knowledge and civilization mm. requires basic research. So I, I, philosophically, I want to do basic research, and on a day-to-day -day applied basis, or day-to-day -day basis, I want to, the applied research sure. is an easy sell. Sure. Um, the, Can the we have it both ways? The problem is when our system gets so heavily biased one way or the other right. that both don't happen. And so... Part of me wants to go with the easy answer that you know we need a middle line where you can do a certain amount of basic research and you can do a certain amount of applied research. Um, if the funding agency is so far biased towards applied that it's impossible to do basic research, then we're in trouble. 
if the individual researchers are so tied up in, in having to do fundamental research that nothing's applied, then we're mm. in trouble. And so, you know, honestly, I don't have a better answer than maybe the, the solution is finding that middle line um, where labs are doing some of both. Um, I know the lab where I did my PhD at South Carolina um, does a very good job of that. And they've done mm -hmm. a lot of applied genetics looking at, at questions of conservation. And then we did some really good basic fundamental science that wasn't applied uh, when I was a PhD student. So, you know, maybe mm -hmm. that's the answer. Um, yeah. But I, yeah. I don't claim to have the answer. And, and this is certainly something no. I struggle with uh, philosophically myself. Yeah. Except for the vampire yes. thing. I, I'm definitely against the vampires. We, yeah, <laughs> vampires and zombies, we just don't want to see that. It, I was thinking about it. It reminded me of the, sort of the... You know, it's, it's the never-ending cycle of when you do sort of basic research and someone says, well, what's it any good for? And it always makes me think of the Michael Faraday story. Are you familiar with the Michael Faraday story? Uh, who was a, a yeah. physicist who, who researched electricity back in the early part of, of the last century. And he did a demonstration, um, public lecture one time, about sort of, you know, the basics of electricity as it was just getting going. And someone came up to him afterwards and said, but of what use is this? And he turned around and said, well, of what use is a newborn baby? Right? And his point was, well, we don't know yet, but we know it's got huge potential, right? But at the time, if you think, you know, 100 years ago, we had no idea what electricity would lead to, right? And so, you know, it's a bit of an apocryphal story maybe, but it, it at the same time says you don't necessarily know what's going to come out when you allow basic research to, to progress. This so is the Internet anyways. Yeah, yeah, I, that, that's yeah. a great story. I, I, I can, I'm sure that there must have been a less, a less confrontational answer than newborn baby. <laughs> uh, no, that's but, what but it was. I, 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 You're just sensitive <laughs> to that because you have one. <laughs> that's true. That's true. And, and Lila started daycare yesterday, so and I, I she am can super be sensitive. everything. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> there you go. Uh, but it, I, I mean, the, the point is well taken. <laughs> Whether there's a better way to, to put it or not, uh, we just don't know. And, and, and this is the this is the argument for basic science: is yeah. um, you just don't know what what's going to happen next. And if if all research is applied, then we're working at whatever the status quo is to to really push that, and we're not going to make any any big leaps. Um, mm -hmm. And I. Like I said, I'm not a historian of science, but I think if you look at the history of science, you're going to find plenty of examples like the, the, the Faraday example, um, where we just don't know where the, the, the next direction is, is going. Um, yep. And that's, that's, that's a really good point. Gentlemen, this has been uh, a really interesting show here today. I think this might be either our fourth or our fifth in the news. I'm not sure, but this has been, I think, the most interesting in the news show we've had um, we're so lucky out there, you know, the teachers and students of Canada to have you guys talking about these types of <laughs> issues. Uh, oh, yeah, they are, absolutely. I, I, I will say that on your behalf. Uh, Thomas Merritt at Laurentian uh. University, Colin Jago at Kawartha, the scientist, the mad scientist, the fruit fly guy, and uh, the, uh, the incredible educator over there at Kawartha. I, I think this might be a good place to wrap it up because I'm not really sure where I'm going with this other than it's been a lot of fun. I don't know. I can't wait to do it again next week, guys. <laughs> Thanks a lot, right, fellas. See you next week. Thank you. See you next Appreciate week. Appreciate you hanging out late.